Sharing and Protection Act, and it's a proposed law in the United States which would allow for the sharing of internet traffic information between the United States government and technology and manufacturing companies. The stated aim of the bill is to help the United States investigate cyber threats and ensure the security of networks against cyber attacks. So our audience member would like to know your position on uh, the Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protection Act. And our first speaker will be Drew Christensen of the Republican Party. I, I mean, I don't, I don't have the text of, of the bill in front of me. I, I could say I could support a version of that, and there are also versions that I could not support. I could probably support a version of that that's purely for national security purposes and defense against foreign threats to our cyber security and our defense uh, cyber apparatus. But I don't think I, a bill that would empower the government do more go after like the copyrights, the, like with, with we saw with like the SOPA PIPA last year, which Senator Amy Klobuchar voted for. I, I probably wouldn't support that sort of a system because I think it puts too much power in the hands of the government to go into mm. domestic issues as opposed to merely defending us from foreign policy powers. But the government does have uh, the I would argue the, the the obligation to defend a free internet from foreign uh, foreign entities that would seek to limit a f internet. Mike Lensgray, Young Americans for Liberty. Um, I'm very much opposed to CISPA. Um, I believe it's very uh, Orwellian. Uh, for those of you who read 1984, it's very much Big Brother in effect. The internet needs to be free and unregulated as the spreading of information. The, the spreading of information is crucial, crucial to mankind's progress, um, the, and the internet is truly the last bastion of free speech, as we see now. The, the mainstream media is very much regulated uh, by certain corporations, and uh, it's very biased in the information that they present. Um, obviously, there is a, some security threat, but I believe there are much better ways of handling it than to simply just uh, allow the government to um, warrantlessly uh, look at every single email we we've sent, you know, every you know our Facebook profiles, stuff like that, and it it gives private companies incentives to give this information to the government, and they are protected by this law um, to do so, which is very dangerous, and it represents a drastic infringement on our personal liberties and our personal freedoms. Brandon Madsen, Socialist Alternative. Yeah, I also strongly oppose CISPA. I think this is just the latest in uh, a series of moves in the direction of an increased police state in this country, I think, a, and dragnet surveillance, where uh, instead of having to get a warrant to investigate a specific crime, there's just constant uh, monitoring of everyone's activities, and that's especially true on the internet, where it's all filtered through these few big companies. And what this bill does is basically allow those few companies to uh, turn all the user information and what people are doing online over to the government. Um, 
no questions asked, basically. And that is extremely problematic. I would go a step further and say I'm against uh, any sort of uh, prosecuting of people for breaking uh, copyright laws and things like that. I think that actually, as probably most people in this room know, it's really nice to be able to get free movies and music uh, and stuff off the internet. It is a benefit to most people. I think most people are experiencing that. Uh, and I think, as uh, I agree that it's holding back progress to stop the free flow of information. I think this is an example of trying to legislate the right to make a profit on something and it's uh, sort of holding back the natural progress that would happen uh, otherwise. This is one way in which I think the capitalist system and its legal framework is holding back the progress of our society and what we can achieve. I do think artists and software developers and so forth do need to be supported, do need to uh, make a living. I'm not saying uh, you know, that they should just be left to starve by any means. But uh, I think that there's a better way to regulate that in our society um, than by putting people, uh, taking people to court uh, for absurd sums of money for doing totally uh, innocuous uh, downloading. And I think that we should put public funds into supporting the arts, right. into supporting software development, and so Thank forth. You. Thank you. What Watham, comma, Democratic Party? Well, li listen, I, I think artists and musicians they deserve a right to make a living. I think that's something that we're gonna have to deal with. I don't know how with the internet age, I don't have the answer. But particularly to, to CISPA, it's, it's a bad piece of legislation. It was written poorly. President Obama has vowed to veto it. I do not support it. Thank you very much. Okay, our second question, uh, very straightforward. What is your position on gun control? Let's start with Winton, Botham, Akama from the Democratic Party. I'm a, I'm a strong supporter of gun control. Um, I think the Second Amendment reads well regulated for a reason. I, it's 600 kids are going to die in Chicago this year from gun violence, and it makes me sick to my stomach. We we have a there's a national epidemic in this country, and we have far too long have been afraid from the gun lobby to do anything about it. And these Republicans, and even some Democrats, I will admit, are afraid to do the right thing and act. Nobody has a right to own a machine gun. Nobody has a right to own an assault light rifle. You know, if, if the Second Amendment means that I, uh, that I can own anything I want, I'm gonna go buy a tank after this debate. I am so sick of the way that both parties, uh, eight members in my party, the four senators who voted against the universal background checks, I think they should be primaried, and I think they should be thrown out of our party. I do not, I am very strong on gun regulation. We have a national epidemic. We've been far too long. Oh, I'm getting, I'm getting too upset about this. I, I've come up. <laughs> Brandon Madsen, Socialist Alternative. I think that if implemented in a measured, reasonable way, gun control uh, can be fine as part of the solution to the problem, but I, I don't think it's the solution, and I don't think it fundamentally solves the issue of violence in society. I think we have to look deeper for that. I think that there will continue to be widespread violence no matter what you do uh, with gun policy. Um, it's just going to, um, but it depends on some of the deeper roots. Uh, such as poverty, such as uh, homelessness, such as uh, feeling alienated from the society you live in. I think um, most uh, people have it quite hard growing up right now, and I think that it's been shown again and again that if you have uh, a society that takes care of people, where people are secure, where people have uh, not only uh, enough to live on, but a sense of security that uh, they're gonna be okay, and a sense of community with the rest of the people around them, that creating a different culture can help to end violence. And so I think that that is something that, uh, I think violence is inherent in the cutthroat capitalist system, and I think that it's gonna continue regardless of what we do with gun control, but I do think we have to you know, look at that um, as, uh, one reasonable piece of the solution in the short term, but we need longer term structural solutions as well. Michael uh, Lensgrave, Young Americans for Liberty. Oh. I am very much against gun control. The Second Amendment is crucial to our defense against tyranny. Um, contrary, <laughs> contrary to what Quinn said, I do believe we have the right to own uh, semi-automatic weapons definitely and my personal opinion is I think if you want to own an automatic weapon you should be able to as well. 
Um, if we took away our right to own guns, only the government would have the guns. And as we all know, the government is not very trustworthy. And Quentin even mentioned Chicago, but Chicago has the strictest gun control in the nation. And since 2001, twice as many people have been killed in Chicago from gun violence than, uh, than U.S. troops have died in Afghanistan. So it's pretty obvious gun control does not work. Criminals do not obey these laws, and they only end up hurting law-abiding citizens. Um, in Georgia, in a small town in Georgia, I can't remember the name, but they made it mandatory for the head of household to own a gun, and immediately all sorts of crime went down, from gun violence to robberies and uh, you know, rapes, other crimes of that nature. I believe in this country it's a mental health issue, um, and, it's, we're, and the uh, politicians are taking advantage of it to uh, try to regulate our rights to own our firearms, to defend against tyrannical policies. Um, we need to be looking at the link between uh, mental health and gun violence. And even as far as backgrounds, um, you know, they phrase this so like, oh, who can be against background checks? But the thing is, they're creating a national registry for gun owners so they know who has them. And it's, as they say, it's the first step to confiscation is registration. So it's a dangerous, slippery slope, and it scares me, frankly. So I think we need to le uh, legislate smarter policies that just have net, uh, universal background checks to create a registry for gun owners. I am 100% for the Second Amendment. I'm 100% against gun control. The problem with our government is they want to take everything away from you that they think can, can be used badly. Well, a lot of things can be used badly. This 20-ounce uh, Sprite uh, might give me a heart attack in 50 years. <laughs> And Mayor Bloomberg in New York wants to take it away from people, tried to, did make it illegal before the courts overturned it. And it's this same kind of mindset in gun control that these things can be used poorly and thus people shouldn't be allowed to have them. What's your solution to gun violence in Chicago? Should they take, should they take away all the gun, not allow any guns in the city of Chicago? You know, okay, you okay? Absolutely. No guns in the city of Chicago. Uh, <laughs> if, the, the thing is, is that's if you want to amend the Constitution, if you want to change the Constitution, you disagree with it, that's absolutely fine. The founders included a process in the Constitution to change it if you don't agree with it. So I'd invite you to try and amend the Constitution to repeal the Second Amendment. Uh, I'd, I'd welcome that. I, w I would welcome the Democratic Party to publicly endorse a repeal of the Second Amendment. <laughs> I would love that. Okay. On that? Or can we maybe say something additional on that as well? Or not? I think we'll have a chance to question and answer okay, because I think people are going to want to ask about that. It sounds like we've had a response before. Um, third question. Can we, can we prevent global warming? And if we can, should we? And we'll start with Brandon Madsen and the Socialist Alternative. Yes, global warming can be prevented. Um, I think that uh, the issue of climate change is extremely important, and the reality is that the technology to uh, switch over to a 100% renewable energy economy exists right now. The only reason it's not being implemented is because the political will to do so is lacking, and because there's no plan to do so. Right now, it's just up to each individual company to do whatever they're going to do with their uh, business, and I think that uh, they're never going to switch over uh, to a fundamentally uh, different renewably powered economy uh, on the basis of a for-profit for system because it's just not uh, economically in their interests. They're not going to put that huge outlay of funds that would be necessary to totally change the way that everything in society is produced, distributed, and powered. Uh, because it's a massive overhead cost with very little return. That said, it would be in the benefit of the vast majority of people. You could give many people jobs to do this. It would uh, create a better world for future generations and a better world for many voices around the world. Right now, they're already, already suffering the consequences of climate change. So I think we need to move in that direction. I think we need a federal green jobs program 
uh, to put people to work developing and implementing green technology um, in every city around the country, mass transit, um, and to make those jobs living wage with union benefits um, and so forth. Hit two birds with one stone, the economy and the environment. Quentin Watham of Kama, Democratic Party. I, I agree actually with a lot what Grant had to say. I think uh, I would love to see like a green job, like core program. Um, I'm an urban studies student, so I'm huge on mass transit. I think this country has become far too dependent on cars. We need uh, we need a grid infrastructure system such as, you know, we've, in here in Twin Cities we see a, a massive expansion of uh, local mass transit, we need regional mass transit, we need to try to become as carbon neutral as possible. I mean, global warming is such a big issue. I, I don't know how, I can't say that I can give you the answer how, to, how we should tackle it, but I think we need to start making policies, we need to start investing in green energy, we need to move away from things like coal. There is no such thing as clean coal, I'm gonna preface that right now. Um, and I think we need to actually even look at an all of the above. I'm, I'm in favor of nuclear power as a form of uh, energy. I think if it's if it's carbon neutral, I think it's something that we need to look at. Um, that's about it. Drew Christensen, Republican Party. Well, I, I mean, first of all, I, I disagree with the premise of the question in that uh, what do we need to do regarding uh, global warming. I, I don't think the the jury is yet in on uh, on global war on climate change, whether it is man-made or whether or what exactly the uh, the effects of it are. And frankly, in in the last ten years or last twelve years or so, there's been little warming nationwide. Not to mention the Earth goes through cycles in. Uh, Mr. Uh, Uhu, do do you know what the temperature of the Earth was uh, 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 three million years ago? Because I don't, and I don't think scientists can, with a lot of certainty, detect tiny degrees of temperature changes from millions of years ago, and then equate them to the tiny tenths of a degrees of temperature changes that we see today. I think it's something that we should look at and the science we should look at. You know, as Quentin said, I'm for an all of the above energy solution, an energy solution that includes uh, the solar power, wind power, oil, coal, all of the above. Nuclear, I think nuclear is a great option. I think we should uh, look, look back into Yucca Mountain, which President Obama closed. Uh, I think nuclear is a great option. It's a cheap option, an economical option, and I absolutely think we should have an all of the above energy approach that's determined by the free market. Mike Lensgrave, Young Americans for Liberty. I actually agree quite a bit with what Drew just said. Um, it's funny how they changed global warming to global climate change now because, in fact, the uh, projected trends that the government gives us do not match up with recent data, and a lot of this. Is um, it's hard to, uh, like he said, it's hard to know exactly what our climate did over the past centuries and millennia, because now we've had such increased technology with like satellites and you know um, other methods that we can really pinpoint global um, temp variances and temperatures much better. So we're just starting to get accurate data on, on, on a global basis. Um, but I do think. Um, our current system is flawed. We are too reliant on um, oil and petroleum, but I think instead of having like a federal green jobs program, we should let the free market solve the problem. Um, for instance, uh, this is just a uh, federal green jobs program is just another uh, example of government malinvestment because the government is nobody spends your money as well as you do. The government is no exception. Um, a good example of this is with Solyndra. Obama gave several, several hundred million dollars to them and they went bankrupt. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, I believe that we can, I believe our climate is changing, but I believe a lot of it is um, a result of solar activity. The sun is the main driver of planet temperatures, not us humans. Um, and so I believe we need to better understand the situation and look for free market solutions to the problem. Schedule, so we're going to have one more question from the audience, and then we are going to leave the stage and let you have Adam. <laughs> but, but in the meantime, we're going to ask you to hold your comments up until the open Q&A. As much fun as we're all having.
Yes, and we'll be completely open and we will leave the stage. But someone has observed that there are no women on the stage. How could you close the gender gap? Or what is the role of women in your ideology? And we'll start with Drew Christensen from the Republican Party. I'm excited to address this question. I think, interestingly enough, I was, uh, as far as why I'm up on the stage being a man, in our, <laughs> to clarify, the, uh, in, in the college Republicans, uh, we talked about who would represent us, and it's kind of nobody wanted to do it, so I stepped up to the plate. But interestingly enough, our chair is a, our chair, our chairwoman is a woman. Our executive director is a woman. We have many. I, I'm pretty sure there's more women in college Republicans than men right now. But so as far as that, just that caveat, as far as women in politics, I think it's interesting because if you look at the amount of women who win elections, women win elections at approximately the same rate as men do. Just far fewer women run for these political offices than men do. So I would say to solve the gender gap, I look at everyone in this room, at all the women in this room, and I would encourage you to run for political office. I would encourage you to get involved with politics, be, be it with my party or the Democratic Party, whichever you agree with, I encourage you to get involved, and that's how you close the gender gap, is, is to get involved and to run for these offices. Mike Lensgrave, Young Americans for Liberty. Um, I think we need to stop thinking of people in groups and start thinking of people as individuals again, not just not just men versus women or black versus white or Christian and Muslim or Democrat and Republican. These are merely ways to divide our society against one another. We are all one and the same people. I mean, we need to realize that and um, I think we need as a society to change the way we think about groups. We, we need to yeah, stop thinking of people in groups and start thinking of people as individuals with the same inalienable rights that are given to us by nature and that no one can take from us. Um, that being said, we do have quite a few women and young Americans for liberty. And uh, yeah, um, if you're a woman and you're interested in liberty, come check us out. <laughs> Brandon Madsen, Socialist Alternative. Well, uh, I think the sentiment that we have to stop thinking in groups because they're just divisive, you know, there's something appealing to that in, in the sense that I do think that most of us share many of the same fundamental interests and that we should all uh, band together across gender lines and so forth. That said, I think it's very important to understand that uh, there is not equality in society, and so it is necessary to talk about the oppression that exists along uh, the lines of these groups, uh, even if we wish it didn't. And women still make less than men uh, for the same jobs. There's 80% of housework is still done by women. Uh, I believe the stat is one in six women will experience sexual violence in her lifetime. That's one in three in the military. Um, and so it's. There's still uh, very serious problems out there. We are not in a uh, sort of post-feminism society or something like that. I think that any uh, serious activist for positive social change should also be a feminist. Um, and I think that uh, that's the that we need to keep the particular issues faced by women in mind um, when we're talking about any political issue. I think that's true, even if you're talking about things that that's not clear with, like. Um, the foreclosure crisis or cuts in public services. Those disproportionately affect women and disproportionately affect women of color. Um, and so I think that um, this is still an important framework in which to think of these things. And I think the, um, the fact of the matter is that um, it's built into the system that we're in to have this sort of gender uh, oppression. It's been there for many, many uh, hundreds and even thousands of years, but I think we're at the point where we as a society can overcome that, um, that we can take many of the tasks that have traditionally been put in the realm of women's work and uh, spread them out, socialize them, um, and uh, really achieve equality.
this is verbatim. I've noticed there are women, no women on stage. How could you close the gender gap, or what is the role for women in your ideology? Well, I just want to say that I'm up here because nobody else wanted to do it. But let me just say, at college gyms, we have binders full of women. <laughs> um, I'll just, just got to preface that. Um, in my ideology, I think women and men need to be on the same equal footing. Um, I myself am the son of a single mom, and I watch my mom struggle, and I've seen, and I think I really appreciate all the you know things she's done for me. I think that um, we need to respect women's reproductive rights. I think we need to in make, uh, encourage women to get to. Um, we need to have programs that encourage women to get into the workforce. I think we need to start looking at, I think, things like all-day kindergarten and childcare are very important to uh, helping women advance into the workplace. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of fried. <laughs> okay, well, what we're gonna do is, uh, people can raise their hands and speak. Uh, we can't really do this spontaneously. We have to call on someone. And we also wanna make sure that one person responds and other people have the opportunity. So I think Austin's going to call on folks and just be sure you give everybody a chance to respond if it wants to on the, it's on the stage. OK, so who has questions? All right, I saw Joe's hand up first. Uh, this is a question specifically to Mike. In a libertarian society, who will build the roads? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's a good question, and that's one thing that we always hear a lot for advocates of government. Um, first of all, I want to say I don't think my you know libertarians. Our first priority is not to privatize all the roads. There are many other bigger issues that we would address first. But um, you know, there are many incentives for private companies to uh, build the roads. They private companies currently do build and pave the roads. Um, the it's not like the government has a workforce that goes out and builds roads. They contract, they hire private contractors to do so, and it's even paid for with a gasoline tax. I think it's something like 44 cents on the gallon or something. So, to complete privatization of the roads wouldn't be all that different from what we have now. Um, and obviously, private companies have incentives to um, build roads because, like, let's say big stores like Target or Walmart or you know whatever they they need people to be able to drive to their stores so they can buy their products so they have an incentive to pay um, people have an incentive to pay so I mean it's not like you know without government we just have every you know, we'd have point A and point B and everywhere and everyone in between would just be standing around scratching their heads wondering what to do we'd find ways of making it work and because of competition, it would be probably a lot more efficient than our current system. Thank you, Mike. Also, I think with this open Q&A session, we're going to limit responses to one minute sure. for each speaker. That way we can get through as many of your questions that we have and everybody you know, has an opportunity to be heard. OK, uh, I saw Aaron's hand up that entire time. I'm sorry. And all right, in the green jacket, I've seen you a couple times as well. All right, so Aaron, if you have a directed question, you can ask one. No, I'm, I have a more general question. Okay. At what point? Um, does safety overtake um, our liberties and our freedoms? What, at what point do you, like, do each of your ideologies believe that um, taking away people's freedoms is appropriate and necessary to uh, help people's safety? Is there anyone who wants to take on that first? <laughs> if not, we will have to revert to the order that we had before. I'm not scared. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I think people's liberties are obviously very important. They're insured by to us by the Constitution, and the Constitution is there to defend, protect our liberties from the government. With that said, in the case of a, a foreign intervention in our society where some foreign entity is trying to take away our liberties or you know, a threat to our safety is fundamentally a threat to our right to life, and our right to life, the right to life, I think, is the most important liberty above all of them. So we've seen presidents and governments throughout our history temporarily take away liberties in support of freedom. For my favorite example is President Abraham Lincoln temporarily suspended the writ of habeas corpus during the Civil War for the purpose of defending the liberties of, for example, 
the southern slaves whose right to fundamental rights to freedom from slavery were being, were being uh, violated. So I do think that there are occasions like that, but they are very thank, rare. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, Mike Lansker of the college. Um, I believe that um, it is rarely, if ever, warranted. Uh, ben Franklin said that those, those who give up essential liberties for temporary security deserve neither and will get neither. Um, liberty has, like I said before, it has made our society what it is today, and it is the fundamental principle of our country. So, I mean, if, if someone's going to take away our liberties, I believe we, there should be an equal, equal um, restriction on the government's, what the government can do. So if they say, well, we're going to take this freedom away, away from you, you need to be able to say, okay, well then, we need to take your right to do this from us, or from you. So, yeah, that, that would probably be one of the only cases I would ever consider taking away essential liberties. Thank you. Uh, Brandon? Yeah, I mean, I think the question's posed pretty abstractly, but I'll do my best to answer it. I think, in general, the principle should be that you can do whatever you want, especially with your own body, as long as it doesn't uh, harm anybody else uh, or infringe on anybody else's liberties or anything like that. Uh, that said, I think there are things that are, uh, it's always a question of liberty to do what, freedom from what, or to do what, uh, and safety from what, or, and I think there are a lot of instances in our current society where corporations, for instance, are under the name of liberty allowed to run rampant and put out uh, unsafe products, have unsafe workplaces and things like that uh, without ever having any checks on that. And I think that there does, that's not something that should be a right, that it should be the opposite, where people should have a right to uh, safe communities, safe workplaces, safe products they're consuming, uh, et cetera. Uh, I genuinely agree with Brandon's sentiment. Um, I don't really think there's much more I can elaborate on this one. I guess pretty good to hit the uh, nail over the head. Well, thank you. A green jacket. Uh, yeah. Uh, for the uh, Republican gentleman, I believe you said in the um, in your introduction. Hang on, hang on, hang on. The green jacket behind you. Oh, so. okay. <laughs> okay. He, he says not. Sorry. A little ambiguous with the pointing. Yeah, no, okay. Yes. Green jacket. My question was on uh, public education. Obama's race to the top program, um, Rahm Emanuel in Chicago, um, I think has a similar policy as the Republicans. They've begun incentivizing the privatization of public education through giving more money uh, to school districts if they promote non-union charter schools. And you know, here in Minnesota, we have one of the highest racial achievement gaps in the country that, in my mind, has caused this is exacerbating rather than helping. But what's your solution to the crisis facing public education? Do you support increasing privatizations and charters or more money for the public system or what? And that's an open question to anybody. Again, if there's anybody who's passionate enough to respond right off the bat. I guess I'll get started. Um, All right. I do support the privatization of education. I would disagree with what you define it as privatization um, because the government's giving these schools subsidies, so that's really another form of welfare. Um, a true privatization would, I don't think the government should be responsible in funding public or pub, uh, education. I think it should be up to families and local communities. Um, but yes, I do believe that is a step in the right direction. Um, and uh, I believe we'll start to see an increased homeschooling movement because um, the government is always going to, at least in my experience, I went to a public school, and the, especially in history, the government always spun it so we were the good guys. And we really didn't learn the true nature of, or the, tr the truth to what really happened um, with historic events. and. Uh, so I believe private education would do a better job with that, and it would um, do a better job of teaching our students as well because of competition. Thank you. Drew Christensen of the College of Republicans. Uh, this is an issue I'm pretty passionate about. I'm uh, the son of a teacher. My mom's a teacher. And I think 
that it's often portrayed in being for or against teachers, especially uh, by the Democrats. And I think the true party uh, for education reform, because I think most of us would agree that our education system is grossly inadequate right now, and it underprepares people for the workforce as well as college. And I think that the Democrats don't don't provide any real solutions. They all their only solution is spending more money on the uh, on the problem when other countries have vastly superior education systems to us and spend dramatically less money per student on those same systems. Uh, there are many ways. Our, our, our education system is frankly kind of stuck in the 1950s. I have another 10 minutes, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, Drew. Clinton of the College Democrats. Um, well, my father is an, is an educator. My brother's an educator. Um, so this is something that's really close to me. I think the charter school movement was an interesting experiment, but ultimately, you know, started here in, uh, actually in St. Paul, it's failed. It's a failed experiment. Charter schools don't work. I'm sorry, I don't like charter schools. Um, I think No Child Left Behind was a failure. I think we need, to, we need to stop demonizing teachers. We need to have strong funding for teachers so teachers can do their job. Teachers are taking, spending money on school supplies, working extra hours, and they're not getting paid for it. That's, yeah. Brandon Madsen of the Socialist Alternative. I agree charter schools don't work. I think they're anti-democratic. I think it moves in the wrong direction. We should have democratically controlled schools, community-based schools. They should be fully funded. I do not think the charter school thing was a, was a mistaken experiment. Uh, I think if you look at, for instance, a uh, Montgomery Securities Group uh, stock market prospectus from back in 2008, I believe, uh, you see investors talking about education as the big enchilada, the next uh, sort of opening to since uh, healthcare was privatized in the 1970s um, to make a buck uh, because it's an $800 billion a year industry. And I think that is what has pushed the charter school agenda and that a lot of well-meaning people in local areas have been sort of roped into that as a result. Um, I think we need to fund education fully to make it free preschool through college. Austin, can we uh, continue on this? I guess, can we keep going back and forth on this? Or? Is, is the audience okay with that? Or do we have more questions in the back? It looks like we have quite a few questions that we'd like to get through. Otherwise, I'd, I'd sit here and we could talk about it for a long time. Um, let's in the back with your hand as high as you possibly can hold it. Yes. All right, we have about 25% of the world's prison population with only 5% of the world's population. Uh, it's about a little over 2 million people in prison right now. Um, they're disproportionately black, uh, Asian, Latino, Native. Um, what, uh, what do you offer as a solution to this problem? Because that's primary, primary, well, I'd add that that primary could not go down with this great rise in prison population. Not have, have not gone up, have not gone down with this rise in prison population. Okay, so can you cleanly articulate the question? Okay. <laughs> what is to be done about our our uh, oversized prison population, 25% of the world's population, or prison population? Um, it, what is what is to be done to lower that number? Um, we it hasn't we it's shown that uh, it has not uh, uh, lowered crime rates. So what can we do about this to free up some of these people that are in prison? Wrong. So how do we fix our broken prison system? Yes, exactly. Okay. <laughs> Is there anybody who has a succinct answer to this question? Um, I believe it's the, um, we need to fix the laws that get people in prison, particularly the war on drugs. Um, if we ended the war on drugs, a significant portion of our prison population would be released as a lot of um, nonviolent uh, offenders are incarcerated for merely possession of drugs or the distribution of drugs. Um, and as a libertarian, we believe you should be able to put um, whatever substance you want into your own body because um, making these things illegal simply increases or decreases the supply which drives the price up and gets puts these um, bad people like the drug cartels it gives them a lot more power so um, if we were to do that I believe it would um, it would help a lot with our prison population that would be the main um, thing I would advocate it's more of a problem with our laws than it is with our prisons Let's go to Brandon Madsen of the Socialists. 
I agree, we should end the war on drugs. Uh, I think also the uh, prison population, there's a revolving door phenomenon as well where people go to prison once, they have a felony on their record, and then they go out and they can't find work, they can't find any stable life, and they have to turn to crime again and they wind up there again. I think when uh, funding gets cut, it's often rehabilitation and training programs that are the first things to go. I think those need to come back. Um, and I think we need to expand them to increase the opportunities people have uh, if they get out of prison. And in general, I think that we have, uh, that a lot of crime in society has social roots. I think that if you can tackle problems like poverty, you will see a decrease in crime rate. Uh, as standard of living goes up, uh, crime rates are going to go down um, when you don't have people who uh, are insecure and angry and need to uh, fend for themselves on the streets. That's going to improve uh, the safety of society. Thank you, Brian. Quentin. Well, I think we need to end the war on drugs. I think we need to lower it mandatory minimums. Uh, I think we need to look at decriminalizing uh, a lot of drugs and, and taxing them to bring in revenue. I also think we need to, re in the meantime, like I said, uh, with the removal of mandatory minimums, I think we need to, uh, if you are convicted of a non-violent tr uh, drug crime, I think you should be able to receive federal benefits such as uh, well, uh, food stamps, um, uh, financial aid, et cetera, because that is also exacerbating the problem. But ultimately, I do not support the war on drugs. I think it's time to end the war on drugs. Problem with our uh, prison problems actually goes back to education, and that our education system is failing us. Uh, one, you're welcome. <laughs> they, uh, I think one of the main problems with our education system it has to do with teacher pay, and the fact that there's been so much opposition in this country to incentivized pay for teachers. Why should good teachers not make more money? than the average teacher, and bad teachers should make less money than the average teachers. And I'm not demonizing teachers, because I would never demonize my own mother. But, <laughs> but I've had a lot of really fantastic teachers in my lifetime, and I want, those, I want those individuals to make more money. With that said, I've had some really terrible, terrible teachers in my lifetime. And in this country, it's almost impossible to get a teacher fired for, frankly, just being a bad teacher. You, I mean, <laughs> they have whole rooms. Thank you. In... <laughs> um, next question from the gentleman in the back right, the jacket, sorry, with the button down. Yes, you. Yes. All right. Uh, <laughs> so uh, this was out to anybody, but uh, specifically, Mike, uh, you, you brought up the idea that registration leads to confiscation of weapons. I mean, I, I have something which I'm not sure about other people's, but it's called a driver's license. And I have to register myself in the state to uh, drive a car. I also have to own a you know, title for my car. And all this information has to be kept in the national, but at least the state database, um, which I'm sure the national government can use if I commit a crime um, and help track me down. But, uh, you know, why can't we just apply the exact same concept as owning a driver's license to owning an assault rifle? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I just, when you look at history, it's always been an indicator of uh, confiscation. It's always been a precursor to confiscation. And the way I look at our current political situation right now, it really scares me because I don't trust our federal government. I don't. I would not like to know. Let have them know which guns that uh, I own or how many I own. Um, that being said, uh, I think there's a reasonable way to um, come to a compromise uh, between a certain a sort of gun registration, but um, uh, but yeah. When you look at history, it's always been, it's always been a precursor. And whether it's been Nazi Germany or Maoist China or Soviet Russia, and uh, when I look at that in the current, in the parallels to our current economic situation, I see. So this um, is Nazi Germany. Though? Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, is there anybody else who'd like to offer a response to that question? No. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, next question, the gentleman in the front, in the glasses. Uh, two of you said that no women in your organizations would step forward. That's why you had to step forward. Every single oral question from the audience has been from a man. I turned around two questions ago. I saw eight hands up. Every hand was attached to a man. Why don't we men in the audience shut up? <laughs> um, I, I guess that's a question addressed for the audience. So why won't you shut up? <laughs> okay, all right, gentlemen of the audience, uh, why will you not shut up? <laughs> Any men would like to ask? <laughs> The, the lady in the right, in the sunglasses. Most of, our, most of your questions have been social issues, and I'm wondering, how do you fix the economy? And what's wrong with the economy? I mean, it's obviously we have corporatism, which is a problem in this country. How do we peacefully fix our economic system? Uh, I, I think the Mike and I are going to have pretty similar solutions to this, but uh, I think we went over it a little bit before with uh, the banking regulations and that we need to deregulate our economy to eliminate these destructive boom and bust cycles where we have a huge economic boom like was, was experienced at the beginning of the century and then a huge collapse that the government then feels the need to pull us out of that collapse, which you know feels good to the citizens, you know it does make the economy better, it makes people's lives better off. My life's not better. But, no. I mean, we've had quantitative easing, as Mike spoke of, and you're seeing inflated prices in the stock market, but gas is going up, groceries are up. I'm not feeling it. Exactly. Exactly. So, so how do you e fix that? Even so, e like like even the, if the government, when the government does try and make it better, it doesn't do it enough. I mean, frankly, we need to deregulate the system and then allow the system to regulate itself so that we can have even stable growth as opposed to these destructive boom and bust. Thank you. Um, I believe the answer lies in our currency itself. What we have today is what's known as fiat currency, which is money that's literally backed by nothing except the value that we place into it as a society. Um, I believe we need to return to a gold standard, which we had up until 1971. Um, and now a lot of people criticize the gold standard. Um, common criticisms are, well, you know, there's not enough gold to cover our deficit today. But that's exactly the point. Um, with gold standard, we could not uh, rack up such a huge deficit because we couldn't print the money out of thin air like we do today. And also, um, you need to um, go into what is money. Money is just a medium of exchange to measure the value of goods against others and f to facilitate trade. And gold has several inherent, inherent properties that make it good as money because it's naturally rare, which is what you want your money to be in as a good store of value. But how do we peacefully overthrow what we have in place? Because it does um, feel like... I would say just... These are like incredibly complicated questions. <laughs> the level of detail, it just, it's been, you know, like not encompassed thoroughly in a number of books. You know, we have to limit it to a minute response here. In order to I would say... Question. Just, so, yeah, <laughs> I would say legalize competition to the Federal Reserve's government-granted monopoly on our currency. Make gold and silver legal tender, and I guarantee you the Fed and their dishonest money will self-destruct. Okay. So, Brandon. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'll also be trying to be really quick. I think we need to, there's not a problem of not enough to go around. When you're asking how to fix the economy, that means how do you provide to the people of the country the things that they need. And I think that those things already exist. With current technology and productive capacity, we can provide for everyone. So why don't we do that? We, but there's two trillion dollars sitting around uninvested in corporate bank accounts right now that's not going to anything, not giving anybody any jobs or providing any services or things for people to live on. Let's get our hands on that. I think we should nationalize, take into public democratic control of the Fortune 500 companies, the 80% of the economy, and run it for uh, human need rather than corporate profits. And I think the way we can get to that peacefully, I think the answer is the working class of this country, working people already 
create all the goods and services, already do all the work. What's necessary is for people to band together, recognize their collective power, and assert that power. Um, it doesn't require uh, violence to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I guess how to fix the economy, I mean, no. I guess what I, I, I propose, I think we need to invest in the economy. I think government needs to invest in inf massive infrastructure projects. Stimulus, because I think we need to put construction workers back to work. We need to, we need to uh, invest in our critical infrastructure. Our roads and bridges and uh, ports are crumbling. I think we need that. I think if we can put people back to work in construction and in infrastructure, we can not only just uh, put people back to work, but we can also increase uh, uh, the flow of goods and services throughout the economy. Since the gentleman is in the back left ha had his hand up the entire time, um, I'll let him go. Um, this is a question for the individualist leaders of American land equal opportunity. Um, if this is land of equal opportunity, we all Addressed to anyone in particular, or was uh, this addressed to all the panels? It's the proponents of individualism and equal opportunities. So, lovers of freedom. Uh, individualism <laughs> and equal opportunity, and I'm proud to say that. Um, in that vein, I support people's rights to make their own decisions and pursue their own ventures. Uh, certainly, there's a, a, a a disparity in this country, but I think we look at there's also very successful people from the from the sectors of society that you spoke of. We look at the president of the United States right now as the son of a single mother in in an African American, and I think although I disagree with the president on many most policies, I think it's it's very it's very inspiring to me that the son of an of a single mother and an African American who grew up in poverty is the President of the United States. That, even though I'm a political opponent of his, I'm not immune to the uh, romanticism of what's happened. If Clinton wants to go, you can take it. Well, I, I you know, I, I think for too often in our society, we hold our President up as the example about how people can make it. He's not the, he's not the rule, he's the exception. There is so much discrimination and disenfranchisement—excuse me, disenfranchisement that happens in this country—it's it's horrible. Uh, I think we need to we need to really actually it, <laughs> actually tackle the issues of poverty. I think we really need to look at uh, at our education system and really invest in it. I think we need to look at ending the draw, draw, war on drugs, and allowing young black males to have a chance at, at living a productive life. And I guess that's how I feel on that issue. Brandon. So I agree. I think that we need to end poverty uh, in this country. I think tackling that would do a lot to even out the opportunities that exist. We've already talked about some ways that that could potentially uh, be done. I also agree we have to end the war on drugs. Um, and I think also on the prison end of things, making it uh, ending the for-profit prison uh, industrial complex as well in the sense that uh, the incentives end up being to uh, keep prisons open and keep them uh, building them bigger because they end up being the economic base of certain towns and things like that. But I think that the answer, you, these longer term solutions of fixing the underlying structural things are one thing, but I think we also need in the immediate sense to band together as communities across racial and gender lines um, 
to say no to any form of discrimination, uh, racism, sexism, that is getting in the way of uh, people exercising their rights, getting their maximum opportunity, and I think we need to fight back right now uh, and build community support to do that. Thank you. Mike? Um, yeah, I would agree with ending the war on drugs. Um, whether intentionally or unintentionally, it is one of the most racist policies our government enforces, and it, we're spending tr trillions of dollars on it too over the decades. Um, but uh, another primary cause, I think, of the racial disparities is, um, you know, because um, after um, minorities got their uh, equal rights in the 60s, um, they, they had to start, you know, that's essentially starting from scratch. And we have been inflating our currency for decades now. And people don't realize how detrimental that is to the poor and working class. Um, it wipes out this, it, it wipes out the savings of uh, the average person and it makes life that much harder to live. It makes goods that much more expensive. So it's, it's beneficial for people who are at the top because they get to spend this money before it's had a chance to um, trickle through the, you know, the economy and thereby increase prices causing the inflation. So, but the poor, they, um, they don't get the money until after it's had a chance to cause the inflationary effects. Thank you, Mike. Uh, in the sweatshirt in the back. Do you support continuing the social security program? If so, why is it necessary for the government to use force to force myself and my compatriots to invest money into a fund that is consistently mismanaged, robbed of its subsidies, and is unsustainable in the future? Um, I'll start, I guess. Um, no, I, I don't, and I know that's not a very popular position to have, but um, my question for or proponents of Social Security is, uh, what is a Ponzi scheme? <laughs> for those of you that don't know, a Ponzi scheme is a system whereby the people who have paid into the in a system at first get or they're funded by the people who are paying into the system later, and it's very unsustainable. So while it's it, ending Social Security is not popular and it will cause problems, it needs to be done because it will not ever be sustainable because it's based on a model of infinite growth in society, and that is impossible. <coughs> so yeah, I would uh, advocate ending Social Security. <coughs> um. <coughs> as far as instituting, if we were starting from scratch and instituting a program like Social Security, I would not be in support of that program. However, we have had the Social Security program for a long time, so I don't think we should, could or should necessarily just end it immediately, but I do believe we need to phase out Social Security and turn it into a, a more private model. Uh, what President Bush proposed during his presidency was a good start, privatization, the privatization of Social Security is frankly something that's necessary, and, and it's about freedom. I mean, is the government saying that we're not smart enough to save our own money, or that we're somehow unable to create our own system of saving for our retirement? Why does the government have to take our money and put it into these accounts for us, and then hold it, hold it from us until our retirement? Clinton, okay. I support Social Security. Um, I think the program is flawed. I think it is mismanaged. I think we need to reform, but I'm not willing to throw the baby off the bathwater. Um, I think Social Security is a good program. I think it supports uh, millions of elderly and disabled people in this country, and I think that we really need to work, look at reforming it. I, you know, I don't have the answers. I don't know how we should reform it, but I'm, I'm not ready to write off Social Security. And Brandon? Yeah, Social Security was something that working people fought for and won uh, back in uh, the during and after the Great Depression, and I think that that is something that um, we should defend. I think that the only reason it seems unsustainable is the fact that the funds have been raided uh, by both parties over the past decades to pay for other things. It would be sustainable uh, if the funds were actually left there. I think that uh, the other thing is, I do think that 
regular people pay too much into the government right now. I think the more we can shift the burden for things like Social Security off of regular working people and on to the massive corporations that are making record profits as things are so hard for everybody, the better uh, it would be. And I think that uh, that would be a better model than the current one. Thank you very much. Let's go with the gentleman who glasses on the stage left. Um, two of you um, stated uh, a few um, things about global warming. Um, uh, I was wondering if either of you have looked at specific studies as to um, at, it, concerning these topics and um, and are familiar with the ways that the uh, studies were uh, So are you guys scientists? And are you qualified to comment on scientists' work? That's not what I answer. Have you read the studies? I'm, I'm not a scientist. Uh, I do consider myself to be a fairly intelligent individual. Fairly. But I also believe in common sense. And it doesn't pass the smell test to me that in our 150 years, you know, given the, uh, and that's generous to me, of valuable data, of reliable data on global temperature, and really only reliable data in the last 40 years, once we've had satellites up in orbit, to make sweeping statements about millions of years of climatology with that small amount of information seems, does, doesn't pass the smell test to me. I think, the, I mean, the world is warmer now than it was 100 years ago, I and mean, we can measure the temperatures, we do know that, but the cause of that, or the cause of that and the results of that are yet, remain to be seen. Um, Mike, if you'd like to comment. Yeah, I guess I would say you could frame the question both ways. For um, believers in global warming, have they ever read the specific studies, or did they just read the news reports that say, this study claims this and this? Um, so I believe it's a two-way street. But yeah, I agree with Drew on a lot of what he said. We have had a lot of advances in technology in the recent decades that have enabled us to more accurately um, view the, or record temperatures worldwide, and I believe we need um, more data in order to form a more accurate conclusion. Brandon? So though I, in general, have studied science and know how to read scientific studies, I haven't read most of the studies that are out there on climate change. Um, that said, I do trust the scientific method, and I trust the fact that more or less every scientist that's not in the pockets of the oil companies or other companies involved in dirty energy uh, has basically drawn the same conclusion that climate change is real. Uh, so without reading all the individual studies, the overwhelming preponderance of the conclusions uh, from those studies uh, are fundamentally the same. And so that is uh, what I take as the strongest evidence um, as someone who hasn't read all the literature that it is real. I think the other thing is there's no reason not to move towards renewable green technology right now as you absolutely could do it. There was a study published in Scientific American a few years ago out detailing a plan to switch to 100% renewable worldwide to cover all the energy needs. And lastly, Quinn. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a scientist, um, but in my time I have worked with some, I have worked in met with scientists. I have very good friends with Will Steger, who's an Arctic explorer who makes numerous trips up to Greenland um, to dem the document the melting uh, uh, snow melt. So, you know, I'm not a scientist. I guess I know scientists. I know climate activists. I've seen some of the evidence firsthand, well, secondhand, obviously, pictures and stuff. So I'm, I'm a firm believer. Thank you. Uh, we have a gentleman also in the back who's had his hand up the entire time in the uh, green and yellow jacket uh, in front of the pillar. If it's green and yellow. Maroon and, and yellow? I'm colorblind, excuse oh, me. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I'm going to add to the question of the penalties no longer here about the National Gun Registry. If a law abiding citizen has to register, like, register their gun and show the government that they are the owner of that weapon and it is in this national registry, 
why is it then that you do not have to be registered? And ultimately, why is it you do not have to prove that you can vote? Why is that? Why, why you do have to prove you can vote for voter ID. Yes, I know, but it's very fraught. The that there, there it, it is the fact that it was played down. That's, that's, a, that's a false statement. Oh, well. Uh, if that's, a, that's a false statement. I, if, there are people voting in this country. That's false. Okay, well, <laughs> that's, not, that's there false. There are people voting that, who are voting false. that are not able to vote. Do, do you know how many cases of voter fraud there were in Texas in 2008? Eight. Okay. Do you know what Texas? You know what the population of Texas is? One eight. One eight. <laughs> so that, I think that's a, that's just a bad. If you want to ask that question again for me, I'm not going to answer it. That's you got to reframe it. That's fine. The the reason that there are so few recorded instances of voter fraud is that there are almost no mechanisms for finding voter fraud. The, vo the mechanisms for finding voter fraud are fraught with holes. So the fact that there's few recorded cases, the, the cases that where we know about voter fraud are the good cases because it means we caught the person committing voter fraud. Voter, voter fraud is not a concern when we catch the person committing fraud. Voter fraud is a concern when, are you gonna, would you let me talk or do you just wanna? Through it, like I, I like to, to contribute to a constructive debate, but you know, if, if you, the question is about voter fraud. And I see. Democrats and Republicans are the same. <laughs> but you responded to the question about voter fraud, and I'm responding to yours. Thank you very much. That's time. If somebody else has something they'd like to add to this, yeah, I'll just, I'll just say one more thing. I was um. Like I said before, I was a big supporter of Ron Paul during the uh, Republican primary. And I do believe there was massive voter fraud that cheated him out of the nomination. Romney bought and paid for that nomination. And I can give you videos of blatant rules violations of Robert's Rules of Order during county and state conventions, even during the national convention. And for both parties, there were scripted there were scripted uh, answers, like the teleprompter revealed the answers were already uh, there before the uh, vote count was, or the, by the vote, before the audio, auto, sorry, the audible vote was in. Um, in addition, during the general election, there was uh, counties in Pennsylvania where um, I believe 100% of the population voted for Obama, which is very suspicious at the, at the least, um, and yeah, so there's definitely documented cases of voter fraud, and like he, like Drew said, that it's hard to. There are many undocumented cases of voter fraud as well. And Brandon. Yeah, I'm not sure of the extent to which voter fraud is a problem, but if you wanted to solve it, you could just adopt the same system as in Venezuela, where you have a voting machine that you vote on the machine, the machine prints out a receipt, you put the receipt in the box, you can check the electronic results against the box results. If they don't match up, you know, there's fraud. So that would be a way without using voter ID. I think voter ID serves to disenfranchise uh, people of color in particular, poor people in particular, students, um, basically anyone who is highly mobile uh, and is not going to have the same address on their uh, driver's license as uh, they currently live at, anything like that. I think it just makes it harder for people to exercise their democratic rights. I think anyone who's here in the country should have a right to vote. Uh, anyway, I don't think we should be stopping people from doing that. Okay, at this time, uh, the event technically ends at 9.30, although if you guys aren't opposed to staying for a longer Q&A, that's totally fine. However, if you guys stand up and leave, it's no longer rude. <laughs> <laughs>